As more and more people were welcoming cable television in their homes, an event happened on April 27, 1986, that would live in pop culture infamy, and also would tell the federal authorities that there's some new peril out there that they have to pay attention to. That story more next. Hi, welcome to RetroFlix, your channel for movie and TV retrospectives. How many of you remember satellite dishes? And I'm not talking about the satellite dishes, the small ones that are on people's homes now, direct TV. I am talking about the huge ones that were in backyards. And those ones were usually for people that they could not get cable television. So this was, we're looking here, 70s, early 80s, mid 80s. As cable television started to get more prevalent and there were more and more channels out there, people in areas that could not get this were getting satellite dishes. And these enthusiasts were getting there and I love this like the technology, but obviously with that, with this technology came, oh, lots of TV, lots of new TV. Look at these new channels. I mean, it really, it really was a game changer for people. So it was worth them going out and buying a satellite dish and putting this yard and getting these, all these channels, all these, this new programming for free. But what ended up happening was, excuse me, the cable channels, the owners, the people that owned the, these channels, um, they ended up saying, well, there are people here getting this for free. We can't have that. Now, there are people paying for this. But we, can, we can't have anybody there paying this for, getting this for free, even though dish owners didn't, you know, they had to pay for the satellite dish and the maintenance of it, and that wasn't cheap. But the, 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 the uh, channels, they didn't want to hear that. The companies, they didn't want to hear They said, you know, nobody's getting this for free. So what they ended up doing was, and I'm going to look specifically here because this is the first one that ended up doing this. I know of, and this is really what this is going to be about today is the channel HBO. We talk about movies, right, which our YouTube channel here is about. HBO began scrambling its signal on a 24 hour basis on January 15, 1986. It offered subscriptions to dish owners for $12.95 a month. Which in, which in some cases were actually a little bit higher than regular than people that just regularly got the uh, HBO in their homes on their television. But HBO also informed them, the satellite dish owners, that not only you're going to pay twelve ninety five a month, but you had to get a descrambler. Now a descrambler, uh, a, a scrambler, when, when it's scrambled, the signal scrambled, it, it comes through unintelligible. So whenever it gets to where it's supposed to go to, to be able to read that signal, you have to have a descrambler. All right, so to, to unscramble the message. So the, uh, the dish owners were going to have to have a descrambler too that was going to cost them $395, which back in early mid 80s, I'm sorry, that was $395 in early mid-80s, which of today's money is $1,000. So $395 back in the early mid-80s would be like $1,000 today. So they were, going to have to, they were going to have to pay that as well. So they have the satellite dish, they have to maintain that. A thousand or uh, three hundred ninety-five dollar descrambler from '80s prices, and twelve dollars and ninety-five cents a month for the subscription. So this cost this caused a lot of satellite retailers. So there obviously there were companies out there, retailers that had to sell these satellite dishes to people. They started to close their doors because nobody, people weren't buying them at satellite dishes anymore. They weren't going. I'm going to go pay. I'm going to go pay for a satellite dish and then have to buy a $395 descrambler plus pay $12.95 a month for HBO if I wanted it. You know, and how many other channels are going to follow suit? Probably all of them. So it just wasn't worth it. So the business went really downhill. So you had the Satellite Television Industry Association, which was made up of retailers and, and home enthusiasts that had these satellite dishes. And they went to Washington, D.C. and protested to get Congress to protect access to satellite transmissions. One person took this a lot further. 
and he used HBO <laughs> to, for his ladder to, to protest. And this man's name is John McDougall. McDougall owned a satellite dealership in Ocala, Florida. And there was a successful business in the, in the 70s and, and in the 80s, again, until HBO scrambled its signal. And then his business went downhill. HBO was becoming you know, so popular that it was it was difficult to think. Well, if I'm going to get a satellite dish and I want to get and I want to I want to get cable television channels, HBO at that time. If you couldn't get HBO, you know it was it, it wasn't worth it wasn't worth spending that money for to to, to do that. So because of this, he had to take a part-time job. And so he would close up shop during the day, and at night he would go to a part-time job at the Central Florida Teleport Uplink Station. Now this, this facility would uplink, for instance, it would uplink movies to cable television channels up to the satellite that would be beamed down in your home. He would uplink that, for example. So, uh, and, 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 and specifically, he ended up working for a movie channel at the time. It was a paid movie channel like an HBO, obviously not near as popular as HBO, but there were several that were coming out that time in the mid-80s, and it was called People's Choice. And so Mandugal basically was uplinking movies for People's Choice. And he was uplinking one night, well he had actually a couple, he had, he had like the night before he had tried this out. And this night after he was showing Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and it was about time for his shift to be over, he put the satellite dish back into its spot. He knew that where he was going to put it, he was gonna put it, it the satellite dish was still going to go up to uh, the satellite that had HBO on it for the Eastern feed of HBO. So when he put the satellite back down, you know, did his thing as far as putting it to the position it should be in, it would go right to the satellite that would show the Eastern feed for HBO. And McDougal was really upset about what was going on, and he was losing a lot of business because of this. So upset about what was going on, he decided he was going to send a message. Now this actually happened at 12.30 in the morning on April 27, 1986. And he was doing this as, again, he, he swung everything back in place and ready to go. And actually, the movie on HBO at the time was A Falcon and the Snowman, which was actually a very good movie. It was basically a, uh, basically like a uh, Cold War. The Cold War obviously was huge back at the time. So, you know, it was kind of one of those espionage type of uh, movies with Sean Penn and Timothy Hutton in it. Very, very good movie. So about... Oh boy, just a couple minutes into the movie, John McDougall hit a button and that signal went up to the satellite. And a, a technician, HBO technician at HBO's facility that manned that, manned that um, satellite dish, was a, he, he was housed in Long Island, New York. He saw what was happening, and they both tried to, they both struggled for, uh, for control of it. The HBO technician ended up saying, you know what, I, we might damage this satellite, so I'm going to stop. And so McDougal, McDougal signal won out, and then his message was then broadcast over the eastern feed of HBO for about four and a half minutes, starting at around, 12, it was about, I think, technically 1232, I believe, at night on April 27, 1986. So for four and a half minutes during the Falcon and the Snowman at the beginning, this message came on. And I'm going to link up top in a card. I'm going to link, and you can see the message because the last I saw, there was one on HBO. Somebody must have videotaped at that time the Falcon and the Snowman, or the movie before that, and ran it over. Sometimes you would videotape a movie, you know, and you and you and you kind of had and, and HBO's HBO's schedule might you know fluctuate a little bit, so you might tape a movie and end up ha having to guess how long to tape it, and, and you might catch the, the you might catch the end of the the, the movie a that was coming on after it. 
So either somebody was taping the movie before and overlapped with Falcon and the Snowman, or they were taking, or they were going to uh, tape this Falcon and the Snowman and actually got this on videotape, which would be a huge. <laughs> that, if you had that, I mean, that would be huge to do that. Yes, uh, I, I didn't, but I wish I would have. But somebody must have because it was on there. So I will link that up there. So he won that that power struggle, and he was able to get that up. And I'll read here, although I'll, I'll let you watch the link up there, but I'll read here what his message was. The message read, Good evening, HBO, from Captain Midnight. So he named his name Captain Midnight. From uh, Good evening, HBO, from Captain Midnight. $12.95 a month? No way. Showtime movie channel, beware. And so then McDougal hurried up and shut down. He decided, you know what, I'm going to stop at that point. I'm not going to go any further than this. He hurried up and shut everything down and then went on his way, hoping nobody would see it. And not a lot of people did. All right, this, was, this, this was a weekday. Not a lot of people were up at 12.30 watching HBO. Again, unless maybe somebody was taping it, which there are people obviously out there that taped this and somebody kept it around. But not a lot of people saw that and McDougal was hoping that, you know, I would just, I, okay, I, I, I got that out there. Nobody's going to see that. I'm going to be, I'll, I'll be fine. Well... HBO obviously did see this and they weren't going to let it go. People weren't complaining because, again, not that many people saw it on the Eastern Seaboard. But HBO sure did and they weren't going to let this go. So they decided to, um, to go to the, um, the federal, the federal uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and decided to go there and get their help in investigating this, which would go, it would be under their jurisdiction and to investigate and find out who it was. The FCC eventually narrowed it down to only a few facilities that would have the equipment to do this. And so, you know, it was, McDougal was starting to find out there, you know, that was like, okay, you know. You know and, but, but what really hurt him was he was overheard saying that he did this over a pay telephone. And yes, I mean, that was you back the time, 1986. We didn't have cell phones, and if you weren't at home, had to make a call, you had to make a pay phone. Here, he had to make a call on a pay phone. And so there are people around waiting over here, this, and he said something on interstate in Florida, and somebody heard it and took down his information. They came calling, the authorities came calling. McDougal got a lawyer. The lawyer said, you have a 70% chance of beating this. I don't think they have the evidence, but it's still risky and gonna be very expensive. And McDougal thought about it more and he was like, you know, but that's going to mean I'm going to have to lie on the stand. I don't know. This is going to be too risky. So he decided that he decided he was going to cooperate, which he ended up doing. He ended up doing a plea bargain. And the plea bargain was basically he ended up getting um, $5,000 fine, a one year probation, and one year suspension of his amateur radio license. And um, he was he was going to be um, he pled guilty to illegally operating a satellite uplink transmitter was the exact charge he ended up pleading guilty to, and then sentenced to the, to uh, to the five thousand dollar fine, one year probation, and one year suspension of his amateur radio license. What the, what, what, what's basically the aftermath of this? All right. So Congress, then again, just like we had, just like we had with war games, Congress looked at this and said, "This is a new weapon people have." Then, and McDougal could have, he he, he could have accessed other satellites too with this. And they found out that he, he could he could have went into the CBS and there were a couple other stations. And I think there was actually one that was actually a military. The military had something on satellite too up there that he could have actually got into as well so th th there's national security there so they say oh th again this is another pr another thing we have to worry about here with a new new technology and so look what else this guy could have done up in the satellite I mean there's a lot of other things up there than HBO so they decide that they were going to actually then pass a law they passed a law called the electronics communications um, Privacy Act of 1986, which made satellite hijacking a felony. Satellite hijacking wasn't a thing. And so now it would be, they ended up getting McDougal for illegal, illegally operating a satellite uplink transmitter they could do. That was in law. A law. 
but hijacking a satellite was not, and so now it would be a felony. So, you know, if, Mc, if that was on the books and McDougal would have did it, he would have been a felon and probably going away for a long time. And now, that, you know, after 86, that would happen. McDougal, what McDougal did then had them put that law into place. Interesting here, another side note too, in 1987, okay, after this, in 1987 though, there was an incident called the Max for a Headroom hijacking incident that was in Chicago. And if you remember Max Headroom, he, he was kind of like this robotic, like a, he was like, a, like an artificial intelligence type talk show host. It was back in the 80s. And this person came on basically replicating that show. Look, at, you had to add like a costume on of his in the background like it is on the show. And it went on to uh, number, for first they went on to the Chicago television station WG and at 914 interrupted that night's nine o'clock news and it was on the sports it was on a sports segment at that time and the sports caster that was doing the sports uh, you know, sports guy doing the doing the show that night was Dan Roan and he was talking about the Chicago Bears and all of a sudden this guy looking like a um, looking like uh, Max Headroom comes on and, and Dan Roan says, and it comes on for a few minutes and Dan Roan's like, well, if you're wondering what happened, so am I, you know, <laughs> and then he went on with it. And then later that night at about a quarter after 11, that same person went on for a little longer and interrupted an episode of Doctor Who. And there were some pe there are people that have that too that were taping Doctor Who that have that. Um, I think that might be on HBO or I'm sorry, uh, YouTube as well. And if it is, I'll link I'll link that as well if that's up there too, up up top in a card. Um, so, but you know what's interesting is is that incident, and that's a real interesting incident. And I'm not going to go any further on it, but that inter uh, than this, but that's interesting because nobody was ever caught, which which even then is unheard of. They were not caught. And statute of limitations ran out in five years, so in 1992, they could have said, hey, yes, I did it, you can't do anything to me. Nobody's ever done that. Nobody to this day knows who that is. They could be, they, they could, you know, they could be dead by now. But still, that it's just, it's, it, it, to me, to this day, that's really what, uh, that's really what, um, sh it shocks me that those people were never found. That it's just you know, you're all you know. Even then, you know, you're going to get found out, and those people never were. And it's just it's unbelievable they got away with that. So that's kind of that, that, that's kind of a legacy of it, though. But those people got really lucky, obviously. <laughs> um, this is what McDougal said. I'm going to end with this. He said, "Quote: I do not regret trying to get the the message out to co to corporate America about unfair pricing." and restrictive trade practices. That is why I did what I did. That is the reason I jammed HBO. That's the reason I sent a polite message. What I do regret is that I was young and fairly naive in the ways of the media. I didn't grasp the fact that no one understood my motives and that everyone would make assumptions. Had I known that up front, I would have been much more fervent in, my, in explaining my motivations. I had no animus and I had no malice in my heart, end of quote. So that's what, that's what John McDougall said. He's done a few episodes in the, in the or sorry, a few interviews in the, in the, over the years. Uh, I think that may have been taken from what he did with Network World. Um, so yeah, just a, real interest, just a real interesting story. And again, you know, something that, you know, when you come with a new technology, uh, you know, and somebody uses it in, in a way that you never thought was possible because, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? And, and so that's what happened with this. But, you know, just real interesting, you know, with the, 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 the legacy of, of, of what happened here and, and really how um, it really got in the folklore. I don't think John McDougall believes that and, uh, and it looked like another interview that I saw he they believe it didn't make it but I, I, I really I really think it did you know so but it's something you know here I am doing a video on it so <laughs> you know it's still the, you know it's still a part it's a, you know again the Captain Midnight HBO so, 
Hey, thank you for thank you for being here today. Um, I do want to make one last thing uh, before I go. Um, I'm going to be out of town for the next couple of weeks, so I'm not going to be able to do any episodes there. So I won't do another episode until probably I would say probably the week of the 24th. And I'm going to put that down the, in my description as well in case somebody reads that and maybe they don't get to this point here, what have you. But um, yeah, so it'll be like the 24th by the time I get my next one on. And so, but I'll be back with one then. So please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And until next time, that's a wrap.